At this point, we've looked at a very wide variety of biomes, ranging from tundra to tropical rainforest to desert to coral reefs to the bottom of the ocean. In this last section, we're going to turn our attention to the variety in living organisms, because there truly is an extraordinary range of forms and adaptations that living organisms take on. Here on this slide are a few examples to give you a sense of that range. Armillaria ostoyae is a type of fungus, a mushroom, that may appear small to us, but is actually enormous because most of the fungus grows underground. There's a specimen in Oregon that is debated to be the largest living organism on the planet. On the surface, it looks like scant patches of mushrooms, but underground, they are all connected over an area of 3.7 miles and weigh an estimated 35,000 tons. Another example is the tardigrade, also known as the water bear. These are microscopic animals whose incredible hardiness to extreme conditions has been well documented. They can survive in temperatures as low as minus 273 degrees Celsius and as high as 150 degrees Celsius. The Mariana snellfish is the third critter here. It was discovered in and named at for the ocean's deepest trench, the Mariana Trench, where it lives at a depth of over 8,000 meters, where the ocean exerts a pressure that is 300 times greater than atmospheric pressure. So you can see li uh, living organisms show a huge range in habitats, adaptations, and characteristics. And that range is more or less what we refer to as biodiversity. But before we can talk about biodiversity, we need to introduce a little bit about the characteristics of living organisms and how they are classified. All life on Earth is either unicellular or multicellular. Unicellular organisms consist of just one cell and are therefore simpler in structure. Then uh, multicellular organisms that consist of more than one cell and are more complex in structure. However, the simplicity of unicellular organisms gives them an advantage, which is the ability to adapt to some of the most extreme environments on Earth. Single-celled microbes are known to live in polar ice caps, around deep sea hydrothermal vents, and within saline lakes that have salt levels so high that other types of organisms can't survive in them and in geysers and sulfurous hot springs. On the other hand, multicellular organisms contain specialized tissues and organs, which allows opportunities for adaptions to evolve that would not be possible in single-celled organisms. We also know that multicellular life emerged a couple billion years later than unicellular life. And so because evolution takes place at such a slow pace, multicellular organisms haven't had as much time to adapt to the most extreme environments compared to unicellular organisms. Because they have been around so long, there's a lot more diversity with unicellular life. It may sound surprising, but most species on Earth are unicellular. Multicellular organisms may be more familiar to us because they're not microscopic. We can see them. We can interact with them. But in terms of species diversity, they are less abundant than multicellular species. To give you a sense of this difference in diversity and abundance, we can look at how unicellular and multicellular organisms are positioned on the tree of life. Within this figure, multicellular life is entirely encompassed within the blue box. Every other branch is unicellular microscopic organisms. Three big terms that you can see at the top, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, are categories that are called the three domains of life. And these domains are distinguished from each other based on both their physical characteristics and their genetics. For example, the domains of bacteria and archaea both entirely consist of single-celled microscopic organisms, but they are so different from each other on a DNA level that they represent two wholly separate domains. And then within the branch eukarya, most organisms are actually single-celled as well. Only the animals, fungi, plants, and at some stages of their lives, the slime molds are multicellular. So this gives you some sense of different levels of diversity across the tree of life. 
but really we don't have full and complete grasp of that diversity because every species on earth has not been identified not by a long shot scientists estimate that only 13 percent of species within the domain eukarya have been identified and there's even more certainty about what percentage of bacteria and archaea have been characterized because they are microscopic and more difficult to identify and study. This table here shows a comparison between the number of species of each type of species that have been described versus how many are predicted to be out there but not yet identified. The way that scientists make these predictions is by taking a group of organisms that have been very thoroughly studied, like insects or a sub group of insects, for example, and counting the number of species identified in different zones on Earth, and coming up uh, a ratio of how many exist from zone to zone. And then they use that ratio to make predictions about how many species there are um, across these different biomes and with other groups of organisms that haven't been studied as extensively. So as you can see, for one example, over a million different animal species have been described, but different scientists' estimates somewhere between 6.8 and 10.8 million are out there. Bottom line is that there's a lot of biodiversity out there that we know about, but there's a lot of biodiversity that we don't know about because it hasn't been identified yet. This brings us to the question of what is biodiversity and how do we measure it? As we defined earlier in the chapter, biodiversity refers to the number of different species of organisms present in a biome. Traditionally, biodiversity has been measured in terms of relative abundance, which includes the number of species and the, and the number of individuals of each species in an ecosystem. So if we take the example shown in the illustrations on the bottom right, both of these communities have the same number of species of trees. There are four different trees in each area. However, in community number two on the bottom, 80% of the trees are of a single species. Whereas in community number one on the top, the four species are evenly distributed. So community one has a higher relative abundance of each species and is therefore more biodiverse. Today, however, relative abundance is only one tool that is used to measure diversity, and there are other measurements being used to assess biodiversity in different ways, including genetic diversity and ecosystem diversity. Genetic diversity refers to the variety of genes present within a population. This is something that scientists didn't use to be able to assess, but now we have gene sequencing technology that allows us to look at how much variety exists within the genetics of a species. This is significant because DNA is the raw material that undergoes evolution. And greater genetic diversity reflects on the capacity that a species has to adapt to changing ecosystem conditions. A real life example that shows the principle of genetic diversity is embodied in northern elephant seals. The northern elephant seal used to occupy Pacific coastal regions of North America all the way from Baja California and Mexico up to northern California. Then in the 1800s it was hunted to near extinction by humans. In fact, it was actually declared extinct at the end of the 1800s, but people didn't realize that there was a small colony of 20 to 40 seals on an island off the coast of Mexico called Guadalupe Island that had survived. And over the past 50 years, with protections having been established for the species in both the U.S. and Mexico, the population um, has recovered to several hundred thousand seal but 100% of them are descendants of those 20 to 40 who survived the mass hunting on Guadalupe Island. So the species today has very little genetic diversity. Many of the same traits that traveled across the species were lost when the population was reduced to such a small size. Imagine if the entire human population was reduced to just 20 to 40 individuals on an island and then the world repopulated by them. So many traits and so much diversity would be lost, and with that diversity, there's a loss of species robustness to adapt in the face of changes. We talked about this when we looked at monoculture back in the agriculture chapter as well. 
when you only raise one variety of crop and if that particular variety is susceptible to a certain disease or susceptible to drought or some other environmental condition, then you're in big trouble. Other varieties may represent pools of genetic diversity that have disease resistance or drought tolerance, but by losing those varieties, there's also a loss in opportunity for adaptation. So that's genetic diversity. Then eco ecosystem diversity refers to the number of different ecosystems in the biosphere of a particular region. This is so significant because ecosystems represent spaces where unique species interactions take place and those species interactions can be quite beneficial. One example of an ecosystem that is almost completely extinct in the United States is tall grass prairie. Tall grass prairie used to cover 170 million acres in the North American continent, which is 230,000 square, 230, square miles. Today, the National Park Service estimates that less than 4% of tall grass prairie remains intact, and most of it is located in one consolidated region called the Flint Hills in Kansas and Oklahoma. Historically, the prairie was a flourishing and highly productive ecosystem where large grazing mammals, especially bison, would graze and enrich the soil with their droppings, and the decomposition of the dense grasses also contribute, contributed nutrients, and the product was an incredibly rich topsoil that U.S. farmers benefited from for a long time. But now agriculture has moved in, destroyed almost all of the tall grass prairie, and in the process tilled away much of that rich topsoil. One study estimates that almost 58 billion tons of fertile topsoil has been eroded by agriculture in the Midwest. And that topsoil is, is not coming back, at least there's no sight of it coming back, because the ecosystem that created it is gone. So as humans, we no longer get the benefit um, a little later in this section, we will talk about some other benefits that humans derive from biodiversity, but first we need to talk about trends and patterns in biodiversity across the globe. One of the big fields of study that provides us with information about trends of biodiversity is biogeography. Biogeography is the study of the distribution of the world species in both the past and the present. One of the biggest trends in biodiversity that we have learned from uh, bio is sorry. Let me go back a slide from biography. Um, biogeography is that biodiversity is highest at the equator, and it decreases as you move closer to each of the poles. One example of where you can see this manifested is in a comparison between two aquatic ecosystems in different parts of the world. Lake Victoria, which is a lake in eastern central Africa, and Lake Huron, which is one of the great lakes in North America. Both quite large lakes. As you can see, both can be quite clearly um, seen in the satellite imagery. Lake Victoria is 26,000 square miles in area, and Lake Huron is 23,000 square miles in area. So somewhat similar in size, but very different in biodiversity. Historically, Lake Victoria contained over 500 species of cichlids, which just a single family of fish, uh, which were native to the lake. Um, in the 1950s, another predatory fish called the Nile perch was introduced to the lake so that humans could fish it as a food source, which led to the, a mass extinction of the cichlids. But prior to this, the lake was extremely biodiverse and contained many unique species that weren't found anywhere else in the world. In contrast, Lake Huron contains only 79 total sp species of fish, none of which are unique to the lake. They are found in many other lakes in North America. So two relatively similar sized lakes, very different biodiversity. What accounts for the difference? Well, one major difference is the geography related to the equator. Lake Victoria is literally intersected by the equator, so it's located in a tropical zone whereas Lake Huron is located some distance from the equator in the temperate zone. And these lakes embody just one example of the general trend. The tropics are more biodiverse and temperate regions are less biodiverse, especially as you get further north and south. Scientists have several hypotheses as to why this is the case. 
One of these has to do with the fact that tropical ecosystems are older than temperate ecosystems. They have existed in their current state for longer. And that's because 20,000 years ago, the temperate zones in North America were covered in sheet ice, which means there was, uh, you know, very, a very drastically different ecosystem um, uh, than what is there today. Um, so the tropics have had a longer time for development to the environment, which means a longer period of time and more opportunities for speciation, which is the evolutionary process of new species emerging. Another hypothesis has to do with the fact that the tropical ecosystems receive more insulation than temperate ecosystems. We talked previously in our climate chapter about how equatorial regions get more direct sunlight. It's not entirely clear how this would translate into a large number of species, but it may be the case that with more sunlight, more producers, meaning plants, can be supported and that creates more complexity in ecosystems with more habitat niches that organisms can evolve and adapt to. And then finally, the third hypothesis has to do with the fact that tropical ecosystems have more stable climate conditions than temperate ecosystems. Regions in the tropics have less variation in diurnal temperatures, meaning that the low temperatures and high temperatures aren't as far apart. They also have lower variation in temperature between seasons, meaning their summer temperatures and winter temperatures are closer together. And also the length of day versus night doesn't change as dramatically throughout the year. So it may be the case that those conditions create the kind of stability needed for robust speciation and evolution of biodiversity. One other feature of biodiversity is in the tropics is that they have high numbers of endemic species. Endemic species are species that are native to, to and only found in one location. The area to which they are endemic can be very large or very small. For example, blue jays are endemic to North America. You'll find them pretty much anywhere east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, which is a huge habitat range, but not on other continents. Um, on the other hand, uh, Quito Baquito desert pupfish is endemic to a few, just a few springs and ponds in Oregon Pipe National Monument in southern Arizona, totaling an area of about four square miles. Unsurprisingly, the Quito Baquito pupfish is considered endangered because it has such a restricted habitat, and so it's highly vulnerable to extinction. And this transitions us nicely into our next topic on the agenda, which is biodiversity loss. The Earth is experiencing biodiversity loss, which is the term used to describe a decline in biodiversity resulting from the displacement of extinction of species. And to be clear, some level of biodiversity loss happens all the time. It's inevitable. The background extinction rate is the term that is used to describe the natural rate at which species go extinct without the influence of human activity. We know what a normal background extinction rate is by looking at fossil records, which can tell us how many species disappear over a particular period of time. And that rate is about one to five species per million species on Earth every year. However, the current extinction rate is about 100 times faster than the background rate. And this means that during the lifespan um, of the average person in the U.S., 23,000 species will go extinct. This is a very dramatic number, and it's absolutely reason for concern. Conservation agencies within and across countries are trying to keep track of species that are at risk for extinction so that intervention can be made before it's too late. And there is a classification system used by an organization called the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or the IUCN, which categorized each species based on how urgent the level of concern is for its continued existence. On the end of the IUNC classification spect spectrum is organisms that are already extinct. This means organisms that no longer exist anywhere in the world, not in the wild, not in captivity, or not anywhere. A prominent example of an extinct species is the Tasmanian tiger, which was native to Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. It went extinct in 1936 
and, uh, when the last known member of its species died at a zoo in Australia. One small step down from that uh, uh, category is extinct in the wild. These are species that are no longer exist in their natural habitats, but still exist in captivity or through human intervention. One example of an animal in this category is uh, spikes macaw, a parrot that was native to Brazil and has been considered extinct in the wild since 2019. Although there are still some birds cared for by conservation organizations or zoos and efforts are being made to reintroduce them. Then there's category critically endangered. These are species that are facing an extremely high risk of extinction in the wild. Their populations are declining rapidly and urgent conservation measures are needed to prevent extinction. The Albany cycad, a plant that is endemic to the Eastern Cape region of South Africa, is in this category. This species only has 70 individual plants left as of August, sorry, as of July 2023, according to the IUCN. This might look like your run-of-a-mill palm tree, but it's not. It's not a palm tree at all. It's actually more closely related to a pine tree, and it produces seeds and cone. These cycads are a very ancient organism. Their fossils go back through many geological periods, but today many species, including this one, are almost extinct, critically endangered. The next category is endangered. This includes species that are facing a very a uh, high risk of extinction in the near future. They have declining populations and are at significant risk of disappearing of, um, if threats are not addressed. An example of a species that is categorized as endangered is the Iberian lynx, which is endemic to Portugal and Spain. The Iberian lynx lost about 80% of its habitat range between 1960 and 2000. As of July 2023, there are an estimated 156 individuals left in the wild. The next category label is vulnerable. These are species that are facing a high risk of extinction in the medium term future. Their numbers are, aren't as low as endangered or critically endangered species, but they are still at risk and require conservation. Snow leopards, which are native to the Himalayas, are classified as vulnerable. They have somewhere in the range of 3,000 individuals left on Earth. Near threatened is the next category. This includes species that are close to qualifying for a threatened category, but they are not considered threatened. However, their populations may be in decline and they may be facing threats in the future. An example of an organism in this category is the serpentine sunflower, which is endemic to California and Oregon has an estimated habitat range of only 160 square kilometers, mostly mountainous areas that are at risk for climate change. Conservation dependent species are ones that are considered low risk, but they are dependent on conservation efforts to prevent them from becoming threatened. One example of an organism in this category is a black caiman, a crocodile endemic to South America, which is now considered to be at low risk, they were classified as endangered in the 1970s because humans were overhunting them to make crocodile leather. But since then, the species has since rebounded once the overhunting declined. And then lastly, there is the category least concern. This includes species with very low risk and they will uh, not likely to be threatened in the future. Pigeons are an example of a creature in this category. Probably to no one's surprise, if you've spent any time in a major city in America in recent years, you can probably see that pigeons are doing fine for themselves. So those are the categories and some examples of organisms in each category. But to give you a more comprehensive picture of the state of affairs and biodiversity loss, this figure shows different types of organisms and what proportion of them are classified into each of the IUNC's categories. I won't go into much detail elaborating on this, but just to orientate you, the color code is at the top showing EW, extinct in the wild, CR, critically endangered, EN, endangered, etc. And the larger portion of red you see for a category, the worse off this group of organisms is. 
And these have been roughly ordered from best off at the top to worst off at the bottom. You can see that cycads are really on the margins. Amphibians aren't doing well either. I encourage you to pause the video and take a closer look at this figure to get a sense of what the conservation status looks like for these different groups. But for our final topic of this lecture, we're going to briefly talk about why you should care. Why does it matter that biodiversity loss is happening? In what ways uh, to humans do they benefit from a biodiverse world and what do we stand to lose? One benefit we derive from biodiversity is health, specifically medicine. Many medicines are based on compounds derived from living organisms. Some examples include aspirin, codeine, artemisinin, which is a drug that is used to treat malaria, and chemotherapeutic drugs, <clears throat> agents used to treat cancer. The top photo here is of the Madagascar periwinkle, and the bottom photo is of a Pacific U, both of which are sources of cancer treatment drugs. The right photo is of sweet wormwood, which is the source of artemisinin, um, which was recently discovered to be able to uh, be used as a treatment for malaria. Another benefit we derive from biodiversity is agriculture. While agricul our agriculture may be an artificial man-made endeavor, it's facilitated and supported by wild ecosystems that support pollinators, cycle nutrients in the soil, and provide sources of natural pest control. Without these elements of the broader ecosystem, agriculture would not be possible. Additionally, as the climate changes and farmers face new challenges in rising crops, raising, sorry, raising crops under different conditions, it's important to maintain crop biodiversity so that there are available opportunities to develop new crop varieties or improve current ones through genetic modification. Seed banks have, for many years, been attempting to preserve that biodiversity by collecting and storing seeds. The Svalbard Global Seed Fault is the largest example of this. It's located in the northern part of Norway, above the Arctic Circle, where it's cold enough for the seeds to remain preserved, and the vaults have enough space to store 4.5 million seed samples. The third and final major benefit of biodiversity is the provision of wild food sources from diverse ecosystems. We may think of most of our food as coming from farms or ranches that raise domesticated animals. But wild populations of fish serve as a major food source for a large portion of the human population. Fish farms are also a source of fish, but about half of fish are still wild caught and many fish and fish farms are fed wild fish, actually. So maintaining robust aquatic ecosystems supports the sustainability of fisheries, such as the ocean fishery that you see pictured here, and their role as a food source for humans.